Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the math portion of the GRE. We have already solved every single math problem from this book here, the official guide to the revised GRE, the second edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Make sure you work through all the problems. If there is a problem that gives you trouble, that you, that, that you have trouble with, that you have difficulty with, you can watch the solutions to every single math problem from this book from day number 251 through 400. These problems that you see there, on, that you will see there on, 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 in the second edition of the, of, the, of the revised GRE are the exact same problems, the vast majority of them, that is, exact same problem on the exact same page number they appeared in the first edition of the revised GRE. If you are interested in watching the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. The original solutions that I did, that they tend to be a little bit more lengthy, they tend to be a little bit more in-depth. Right now we are in the process of doing, we are in the process of solving the quantitative comparison problems from this book right here, the older version of the GRE, because the quantitative comparison questions are very important questions, they have not gone away, but unfortunately the newer books do not give you enough practice, which is why we are doing the quantitative comparison questions from here. Today is our fifth day in the series. We started this project, this series, from day number 401. We are about to do the second last problem on page number 124. Let's take a look at it. Second last problem, the penultimate problem on the page. Here is what we are told. We are told that we have three quantities, M, P and X. And we are told that they are, all three of them are positive integers. They have to be positive and they have to be whole numbers. Furthermore, we are told that M times P equals X m times p equals x. The question is very simple, very straightforward. All we are being asked to compare is the quantity m versus x. What I would like you to do at this point is to pause the video, pause the video, do the problem yourself, and once you have done the problem yourself, then resume the video always, not just this time. Every single video that you watch for the quantity comparison questions, as soon as I set it up, or for that matter any problem at all, as soon as I set it up on the blackboard, Solve the problem yourself first. You'll, you'll see that you'll get more out of it that way. I will get out of your way to give, to give you the unobstructed view. Pause the video, do the work, and then unpause it. All right. The simplest, the quickest way to solve this problem, to tackle this problem, is to plug in numbers. That's all. Just plug in numbers. We know they have to be integers, they have to be whole numbers, they have to be positive. So let's just plug in some numbers and see what happens. For example, for example, let's keep it simple. For example, we might say 2 times 3 equals 6. That makes perfect sense. 2 times 3 equals 6. In this case, x is equal to 6 and m is 2. m is equal to 2. Now if this were the case, in this case the answer would have been b. But the question is, is this something that has to be true all the time? Because what's going on here, the reason why people have so much trouble with these questions is because they simply do not understand the setup of, setup of these questions. When you pick answer choice A in the quantitative comparison questions, when you pick answer choice A, the claim that you're making is that the quantity in column A is always greater. For example here, if you were to pick answer choice B, the, the claim we would make here is that the quantity in column B is always greater. And when we pick answer choice C, the claim that we're making is that the two quantities are always, always, always equal. And to make sure of that, we have to contemplate all the weird scenarios. All the weird scenarios. And the weirdest of all scenarios are, are, are take place when we deal with numbers like 0, 1, negatives, and fractions. These are the four territories that gives, that gives trouble, trouble to people because they do not think of these weird scenarios. But we can't talk about fractions because we are told they have to be whole numbers. We can't contemplate negative numbers because we are told that they all have to be positive. We can't talk about zero because they have to be positive. Zero is not positive. How about one? That's the part most people do not think of, which is why the percentage is so low here. Watch what happens. What if m is equal to one and p is equal to one? One times one is one, in which case x is equal to one and so is m. And so is m. And now the answer is c. Because the answer changed, the correct answer is D. Other than that, there is nothing in this problem. Other than that, there is nothing in this problem. 
The only thing that, uh, that throws people off is because they do not think of these four weird situations, weird scenarios. These are, what, these are what I call the nasty numbers. They only think of the nice numbers, they never think about the nasty numbers. Nastiest of all is zero. You must always contemplate that should say zero, not zero. R is missing in there. I know that I suck at spelling, but there has to be a limit to how much one is allowed to suck. Zero, one, negative infraction. So one is what is giving trouble. Let's do the very last one. Number 15. Number 15. I need my break. Number 15 is the geometry problem. And in the real exam, when this problem was given, only 27% of the people got it right. Almost three quarters of the people who took the exam missed it. What I'm going to do here first is to give you a, a variation of this problem, not the actual problem that appeared in the exam, but a slight variation of it, and here's the problem. And once you understand what's going on in that problem, then we'll do the real question. Here's the problem. We have a triangle here. Looks like this. We are told that this side is equal to 2. This side we are told is 10. We have P, Q, and R. We're being asked to compare in column A, we have the area area of triangle P, Q, R. And in column B, we have 10. Again, as always, what I want you to do is pause the video, solve the problem, and do it. Your, solve the problem yourself, and then resume the video, and then compare the work that you're going to do. You and I are going to do together in a few seconds. Again, I'm going to get out of your way, so you can pause and unpause in a couple of seconds. Well, let's start then. Let's start with the people who who are in the lowest rung of the of the of the of the contest the lowest the lowest echelon and i don't believe we ever learned about echelon in our vocabulary oh we did what the hell this is spooky echelon day number 66 the lowest level the lowest rung as i said let's first talk about those people those people what they're going to end up doing is they're going to say to themselves the area of a triangle is one half base times height and they're going to say to themselves well this is a very straightforward question because base we know is two and the height we know is ten and then of course two cancel out and they end up with ten they see a ten here they see a ten here and they end up picking 10 in the second column, 10 in the first column, they end up picking C for the answer. Of course, we know that this answer is wrong. This answer is wrong because the height of the triangle, the height of the triangle is not 10. What does the height mean? When we say height of a triangle, or for that matter, height of any picture, what does the term height mean? Well, height means exactly what it says. Height means we want to take, height means we have to take the highest point in the picture, we are to take the highest point of the picture, drop a perpendicular, and ask ourselves, ask ourselves, how much is this distance? This is the height. This is the height. The height of this triangle is not 10. The height is this distance from here, from Q to the bottom here. From, from Q to the bottom. We do not know the height, do we? We are not given that height. So this is the second tier. This is the second echelon, the second rung. This is not the highest level, this is the second rung. And they say to themselves, well, I know the base, base is 2, but I do not know the height. I do not know the height, and since we do not know, the, we, since we do not know what the height is, without the height, we cannot figure out the area, and since we cannot figure out the area, how can we compare it against 10? They said the answer is D. This is what they say. This answer is also wrong. But the reason why this group of people is higher than the first group is because at least they understand, at least they understood the point that the height is not 10. The mistake that this second tier is making is that they do not understand the notion of these questions. These questions are called quantitative comparison. 
which is why I make a point of writing down the word computation and then I cross it out for emphasis. These questions are not called quantitative computation. Nobody is asking us to compute anything. Whenever you see quantitative comparison questions, nobody is asking you to compute anything at all. You are simply being asked to compare the two quantities, which we can do here. We do not know what the height is, but whatever that height is, we do know whatever the bloody thing is, it is, it is quite fair, it's quite rational, it's quite logical to claim that whatever the bloody thing is, is less than 10. How do we know that the height is less than 10? Because this distance here, let me put it in a different color so we can see it. This distance here, this distance here is 10. If this distance at, at, at an angle is 10, then going down straight, the height would have to be something less than 10. How do we write something less than 10? We write like this. This means 10 with a negative sign. That tells us that the height is something less than 10. What it is, we really don't give an F. Do you understand? We don't care. We do not care at all what the height is. We are not interested in it because we don't, we're, not, we're not here to compute the area of the triangle. We are not going to sit there and actually try to figure out the actual area of the triangle. We just want to figure out, all we want to know is, how does the area compare with 10? So now we can tell. These two drop out. This is something less than 10, something less than 10 versus 10. The correct answer to this problem, something less than 10 versus 10, which is the second column here. Something less than 10 versus 10, the answer is B. And that is the correct answer, which is why the percentage is so low. Only 27% of people got the point of this question. The remaining three quarters of the people missed the bloody point. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.